right. So, Welcome, everyone. Lost. This particular session is about modern authentication and single sign-on. What we'll take you through this particular session is information about single sign-on, information about modern authentication schemes. So without further ado, let's begin. So this is a general disclaimer. We are going to talk about a few uh, features and few roadmap items. They, can sh they are subject to change without any notification. So this is a general disclaimer for that. So Atul, you know, why don't you start? Oh, by the way, I have Atul with me on stage, and I'm Toshin. I'm sorry I forgot to introduce Hi myself. Uh, and uh, Atul. Uh, Atul, why don't you start? Sure, first? yeah. I mean, uh, we'll just have a quick look at what the challenge is. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Just take a review of what it is, how it has changed over the years. Talk about the various technologies that are used to address uh, these challenges, and then have a little bit of Q&A at the end. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about the challenge. Now, just a few years back, uh, you know, all we cared about was the data center, right? And all we cared about was corporate PCs connecting to various applications within the data center. Uh, I mean, needless to say, now the situation is very different. But just in terms of categorizing things, you have certain stuff which is like your identity provider or your applications inside your data center. Um, you know, you don't have to have it, most people do. Uh, then you use a lot of public cloud services like you know, Salesforce or Office 365, uh, and you may also have a cloud-hosted uh, identity provider. Um, and then you might have some of your own applications running in the cloud uh, in what we call as the private cloud. And on the client side, what you have is uh, sort of your corporate PCs, but also sort of BYOD situations where uh, people are bringing their own devices into your corporate networks uh, using Wi-Fi and all that, and so that's sort of a new thing. And then you also obviously have your personal devices uh, you know, outside the uh, corporate network, uh, or you may have your uh, managed devices outside the corporate network. So what we want to do is provide single sign-on, uh, be able to authenticate either with, with just a password or, or even no password because of the uh, security of the device or some other authenticating factor that you have, uh, that we want to provide the single sign-on uh, in all these different environments. And you know, one other new thing that has come up in the cloud is because these cloud services offer a lot of APIs, um, you know, all public APIs, a lot of applications are available that people can download to their devices and start using them. So another new concern is you want to restrict access to only those apps that, that are sanctioned by your enterprise and not sort of some third party apps that may leak the data somewhere else. Um, can we, yeah. Uh, now, Toshin will uh, take you through some of the application manage access management technologies. So if, if you look at access man management technologies today, right? So we have Kerberos that comes from the ancient realm or the historical realm. Then we have newer forms of authentication called cert-based auth or CBA. Then we have different federation protocols. What federation protocols look like are WS Fed and WS Trust, which is from Microsoft, you know, the old legacy ones. And then we have what modern authentication protocols. These are the new upcoming protocols. The, this includes SAML, this in, includes OAuth, and this it can include any new modern protocol which leverages new technologies. So modern authentication kind of is a gamut of all these protocols, and that's, what, that's how they're referred to. So let's, let's begin. You know, some key terms before we start. So Kerberos, as you all know, it was heavily used by Microsoft and other open source uh, uh, IT, IT providers to leverage single sign-on within their environment. Now, like Atul explained, this geography of environment has expanded diversely. You have cloud, you have on-premise cloud, you have on-premise internal resources. So Kerberos kind of doesn't leverage all these backend resources and provide you single sign-on. So it kind of uh, meets the dust there. So come, there comes the identity provider, the, the single source of truth for your identity. You know, if you as a user exist today, you know, that particular identity provider, whether it be in cloud or on-premise, for example, ADFS in cloud, it can be Okta or Ping, that serves as your true source of identity. And then comes service provider, right? Service providers are nothing but business outlets out there trying to make your business success successful. It can be Salesforce, it can be Workday, it can be anything out there. 
So these tend to be more cloud-oriented these days. So you would see what the service providers don't want to do is they don't want to, the liability to store your usernames and passwords with them. Why would I store your password you know, if I can get rid of it? So that's where federation kind of kicks in. So federation is nothing but a way of you to enable this direct protocol talk one-to-one -one between your service provider and your identity provider. So that your service provider just relies on the true source of identity to use that. And we are going to touch more upon this as we go into the slide. So let's, let's begin with Kerberos, you know, what, what Kerberos did and how. So this is how, you know, legacy systems would work. You know, you have Kerberos, you have certificates, worked great on domain joint PCs. You know, everybody, everyone was happy. But then, came, but then came the concept of services being accessed not through Win32 apps, but through web browsers. So the developers thought about it and said, you know what, we have cookies to do this. You know, one particular SharePoint server can use cookies, which some other service can use too, which is great. You know, it worked great for your organization as long as you did not have a cloud service. The moment you enter cloud, you are going into domains like salesforce.com. Do you want to give salesforce.com access to your cookies? Probably not. So that's where web access management completely failed using cookies and stuff like that. So moving forward, what you would see is this is a consolidated slide about the three different approaches that you have on iOS, Android, and Windows, and where you know each one of them kind of uh, overpasses the other one while it has its own disadvantages. The first one, which is Kerberos constraint dele delegation. Most of you would have heard about this. This works great on iOS. This works great on Android. But the challenge here is you need our SDK in order to build your apps, or you need to wrap them. We have active auth and passive auth. Active auth and passive auth is something that we're going to talk about later. But we have different apps that do this. And you can see I've mentioned that support for Windows is limited because we don't have an App Connect equivalent on Windows. So while Windows emails would work, that's because of something different. That's because of cert-based auth. And you know, we can talk about this later. Kerberos proxy, you know, it, iOS 7, Kerberos on iOS, it worked great. We had a solution. We kind of engineered it ourselves. But this, this is something that I and uh, my team would highly not recommend. The reason being, it has met its time, uh, you know, to be end of life. This particular solution it does, not, does not actually scale well in large organizations. And you probably want to go to something which is native, you know. The great thing about SSO for IT admins, IT admins, in my opinion, would succeed only when their users succeed. If your users are not able to use apps with a single click, you know, you do, you're not probably deploying a successful mobile solution. So that's, that what native, that's what native curves brings. But hey, iOS does it great. You know, iOS today, today allows you to do native curves. So you launch Salesforce, you can use native Kerberos. You launch Microsoft Outlook app, you can use native Kerberos. But what, what, about, what about Windows? You know, Windows does not. You know, if you have a non-domain joint PC, I'm talking about strictly about non-domain joint PCs. You know, it, you cannot leverage Kerberos. There are ways which would mean that you have an Azure deployment, you do an Azure AD join, and then you can deploy, you know, use Kerberos. There are different approaches that we are investigating into, but this is you know, a quick sum up of everything. And like you can see, Android uh, kind of, you know, uh, to, to, be, to be fair, you know, Android is kind of way ahead of its time uh, because they are relying on people switching over to modern authentication schemes instead of sticking to Kerberos. So Android has, has that in mind. But while I'm speaking all this, you know, I still have things that I'm planning to try with Android, and you know, as soon as uh, I succeed, you know, they'll be out on the community. Great thing, certificates. Native Kerberos today gives you a prompt. So if you're a core admin, you would see that your users receive a prompt. In 9.4 version of core, which is going to be out later this month, we are going to show certificates. And that, what that would mean is when the user logs in, 
they're not prompted for their AD password anymore because they're doing third-based auth authentication against your backend Active Directory. So the user does not get prompted. You know, it's, the user simply clicks, and he's in. All this happens in the backend, so the user doesn't know. So let's see you know, how KCD actually works. So you have an app container, you have your certificates, and then that certificate is pushed down to Sentry. Sentry has a KCD file tab. Uh, it's called a key tab. And it basically has Kerberos, uh, a Kerberos constraint delegation rights. So it can do delegation for this particular user based on the certificate that he provided, authenticate the user on Sentry, and then basically proxy for him to the backend service, which would be to any app. So this is how KCD works today. This works for Android and iOS, just like I explained. Moving forward, iOS 9 with Tunnel. This is native Kerberos. You, I have shown Safari here, but this works for any, any app which supports Kerberos. So your app developer has to you know, use special app, Apple APIs in order to do this. But most of the app developers would be Cloud or you know, uh, Salesforce, Outlook, our own apps would support this. Core pushes the configuration. You launch the app. The app probably goes to salesforce.com, and salesforce.com redirects you to your IDP, which is on-premise. Your IDP is tied in your AD. And this is where iOS knows that, OK, you're going to ad.so-and-so server. Let me trigger iOS single sign-on. So once iOS single sign-on is triggered, you get a Kerberos ticket because the user was prompted to either enter the passwords or use third-based auth, like I explained before. User provides this Kerberos ticket directly to SharePoint server. This works great. You know, to a certain extent, this also works for on cloud, uh, cloud services like Office 365 and Salesforce. But you have to keep in mind, you know, this is using Kerberos with on-premise AD stuff. Next. Uh, is cert-based authentication. Atul. Sure. Uh, yeah, so cert-based authentication is sort of a, an alternative to federation, which can be used in the cloud. And, you know, uh, what it uh, unfortunately requires is for the application to be aware of uh, being able to use certificates. So the server is going to challenge you for a certificate, and the application needs to present that certificate. Now, if you wanted to do it in such a way that it only worked for managed applications, then you need to use something uh, like a special SDK wrapping like App Connect in order to make sure that the certificates are not used by unmanaged applications on the same device. Uh, but a great use of the certificate-based authentication is, is to avoid the complexity of having to enter a password uh, when your Office 365 client, uh, your native email client, wants to do um, wants to authenticate to Office 365 for active authentication. So where it is an offline mechanism, you're not uh, using a browser, it can use uh, certificates to, to avoid the user having to enter a password. Uh, and then a lot of times CBA is also combined with SAML where the CBA is only done with the identity provider and not with the service provider directly. And so you authenticate to the identity provider using certificates and then the identity provider generates a SAML assertion that identifies the user, and that assertion is what goes to the uh, service provider. So this is how it looks today, right? This is active auth. Like Atul explained, you know, your, your application is directly talking to your service provider. This can be on-premise, this can be cloud, you, know, you, know, you don't care. The challenge is, like I told explained, your, your app has to support certificates. It has to be in some way or the other. Moving forward, you know, it's, it's a great user story that we have developed in-house is derived credentials. You know, in especially for federal and for fi financial sectors, this is a great thing where a user derives their credentials using their smart cards, registers the device using the PIN that they got using cert-based auth on core user portal. User uses a smart card, logs into user portal, derives a PIN, registers his device without the need for passwords. They actually don't know their passwords. So this is a great way to do that. The one, so once the user sets, uh, you know, registers his device, there's something like a certificate or what we call derived credentials in the app container. And that's used to do 
third base off. Other way, let's let's go into WS Trust and you know Federation identities, right. and Arthur probably will take it. Through sure. That. So, uh, you know, federated identity simply sort of, you know, a service provider will rely using some standard mechanism on an identity provider to authenticate the user. Uh, WS Federation and WS Trust are protocols that you may have heard of. They're typically used in the Microsoft world, and um, it is a, the WS Federation is a protocol that is uh, somewhat older. And it is used by um, uh, Microsoft to authenticate the user in the active authentication case um, to an identity provider. So Office 365 will reach out over either WS Federation or WS Trust to the uh, uh, identity provider. Um, all right. Yeah. So the most popular protocol in, in identifying a user uh, across different uh, organizations is still SAML. SAML is a fairly old protocol. It was, I think, um, uh, it came of age kind of in 2004, roughly, uh, SAML 2.0. Uh, but, you know, what it does is it, it does not require you to have any kind of fancy technology or app awareness or APIs on the client. All you need is a browser. But it still is able to leverage sort of your strong uh, uh, PKI between servers in order to authenticate the user. What that does is because you have a signed assertion from an identity provider that asserts the identity of the user, the liability picture becomes very clear. So the service provider can say, look, you're signing something and telling me that this is a user. I'm going to trust you to do that. So the service provider is, a, is sort of absolved of any, any liability there. So, um, so you know, one uh, one thing that I wanted to bring in is we are using terms like SAML assertions. What SAML assertions is nothing but your identity within the SAML protocol. You know, that's SAML assertion. As simple as that. Y you can call it to be a token, but it's called a SAML assertion in technical terms. So, what ties the service provider to your identity provider is the metadata file. The metadata file is nothing but, hey, as an IDP, this is who I am, and these are my service URLs. As a service provider, these are the I URLs that I have. They exchange this information, it has certificates, and that's how the trust is built. You have to do it manually on, on the service provider side and on the identity provider side to build that two-way trust. So this is how it would look. You, know, you launch a browser, you go to salesforce.com, you enter some kind of a username like mobileland.com something, and Salesforce detects mobileland.com, it redirects you to your identity provider, which would be here. And then the identity provider looks at the user and tries to do some kind of authentication. So the great thing about SAML is you can combine SAML with OAuth, you can ca combine SAML with Kerberos. So this can be your on-premise ADFS, or this can be your Okta, or this can be your, you know, whichever uh, IDP you use. The IDP responds with a SAML assertion, even though the authentication was something different, he knows that you came in on SAML protocol, so you need a SAML assertion back. Once that's done, this oh. Let's go back. Once that's done, the assertion is provided back to the service provider who requested it in the beginning, and the service provider looks at the assertion, says, "Hey, great! You know, I have this trust with the identity provider. I trust him." And he tells me that you are so and so, so go ahead, use my services. So this is just the sample flow, and this is how it looks today, right? This is without mobile line access. You have a straight one-to-one -one connection, trust the relationship, trust relationship, and the and the biggest disadvantage to this is there is no intelligence in between. You know, they don't check where you're coming from, what kind of a device you are accessing, and like I told mentioned. There are public APIs for all these service providers. You can have tons of apps out there which probably store your corporate data, and you don't probably don't want to have that. So what we do with mobile and access is we take this trust relationship that exists between your IDP and your service provider. We inject access in the middle as an intelligent device, create a three-way trust between your IDP, mobile and access, and the service provider. So for your IDP, you will have access to be the new service provider, and for your service provider, access would be the new IDP. So what it does is it still uses SAML, right? It's still using the SAML protocol, but now you have mobile and access, 
doing device posturing, understanding where the user comes from, understanding if it's you know if it meets policy requirements, and so on. D mobile LAN access provides not just not this; it also provides you with single sign-on capabilities. And let's look at that. So this is mobile LAN access CBA. So look at this: you have Salesforce and a user who does not have a Salesforce app. Sorry for that, <laughs> but. They're trying to access Salesforce, and they provide some kind of uh, user information for Salesforce to redirect them to somewhere else. So like you saw, you know, there's a three-way trust now. The, the service provider, in this case Salesforce, knows about access sentry. It does not know about your original IDP anymore. It trusts your access sentry, and that's where your device gets redirected to mobile line access. And in turn, mobile and access creates that assertion for you based on your tunnel certificate, which can be from your internal PKI, which can be from a cloud-based PKI, and sends that particular assertion back to the service provider. So for a user, what it would mean is they simply launched their app for app VPN kicked in, and they're, boom, inside the application authenticated. They're coming from a managed device. They're you know, they're policy aware and they are, you know, are coming from the right app. You want your users to come from the right app, not, so, not just probably from a managed device. You want to make sure your corporate data is secured in every way. So moving forward, uh, you know, I would ask Atul to talk about o OAuth and OpenID C, uh, OpenID Connect, uh, which are kind of new protocols. Yeah, so um, all of you must have heard the terms OAuth and uh, it's a very widely used protocol. It's uh, one of the big uses of OAuth is actually in the consumer space, where you know if you're going to let's say Google Photos and you wanted to give access to Google Photos to um, some other applications that you're using, then you would use something like OAuth. And the way it works is that the application, which may be resident on the device or it may be in the cloud, it uh, it launches a browser to authenticate the user uh, to an uh, identity uh, to an authorization server. The authorization server will identify the user using some mechanism, like maybe username, password, maybe something else, and then uh, generates what is known as an uh, authorization grant. And then that authorization grant is, is then sent uh, by the application directly to the uh, authorization server and exchanged for what is known as an access token. And then that access token has specific capabilities, scopes, and all that. And then that is then sent to the actual resource server uh, which is um, which could be um, you know uh, providing the actual service to you. Now the interesting thing here is that the app is aware of OAuth, so it's not like I'm just using a browser like in SAML. The app actually is using an API, which is an OAuth API, in order to get the authorization grant, in order to pro present the access token, right? Um, so um, and now. Although OAuth is used widely in the consumer space, it's, it's used in enterprises typically with what is known as OpenID Connect. Now, OpenID Connect is sort of an identity profile or it's a special use of OAuth uh, for enterprises. And what it does is, one of the, it does two things. It basically says that the, uh, the token, the access token being issued from an authorization server, if it is OIDC, is uh, in the form of a JOT, um, what is known as a JSON, uh, web token, right? And the JOT has its own sort of security properties and all that, and so uh, it, it is uh, understood by a lot of enterprise infrastructure. And the other thing it does is it, it gives you a way to query uh, using that JOT, it, uh, it gives you a way to query enterprise identity profile for the user. So those are the two ways in which it, it extends and defines a profile on top of OAuth 2.0. Uh, now, the great thing about OAuth OIDC uh, is that you can use it with SAML. So because OAuth is more about conveying the identity within your enterprise or within va various uh, services, whereas SAML is just identifying, sort of providing the bootstrap identification for uh, the user, what happens is, if you go into the, uh, the next slide, is that that same diagram that I showed you where the, where the browser launches the uh, so the app la launches the browser and the browser then has to authenticate the user uh, to the authorization server. That authorization server may say, okay, uh, I know this user belongs to uh, this company. I'm just going to redirect the user to um, 
that company's identity provider get the user identified using SAML, and once that SAML token has been received by the authorization server, it then generates the JOT, which is then used internally within that service, so or, or maybe other services. So typically a company like Salesforce might be using something like this, where it, uh, it relies on SAML to do the external authentication, but then uses uh, sort of a JOT to internally uh, uh, author authorize the user to use various parts of its service. Yeah, you know, uh, even today, I don't know how many of you actually use uh, Azure AD Join. Uh, so when you do an Azure AD Join, it's using Jot in the back end to talk to core or cloud. So, if, you know, you don't see it on your, on your Windows desktop, but when we look at your core logs or your uh, cloud logs, we see the JWT token saying, this is who you are. So it's already being used. Uh, 2016 ADFS supports OpenID Connect, and uh, and for your WS Fed is something that's already used in different places, uh, and SAML for that matter is used almost everywhere. So the next discussion would be OAuth, and probably Arthur will sure. Add some more. Sure. Uh, so yeah, I mean, just as a comparison, uh, OAuth, you know, the apps need to be aware about it. It's, it's very common to combine it with SAML, and uh, it's OIDC specifically an application of OAuth to identity information. And, um, you know, uh, we covered the rest, so we can go to the next slide. So this is what protocol should I use? This slide probably is more meaningful to you, is I'm deploying apps and how do I use protocols? In today's world, you have simple internal apps, you have public cloud apps, you have private cloud apps. And on these apps, you, you probably are accessing it from different resources. So this is a quick suggestion of what we have, uh, is you know, if you're using private cloud apps, you probably want to use CBA or SAML. If you are trying to develop it starting next week, you probably want to understand OpenID Connect and use newer, newer protocols. If you're talking about public cloud uh, apps where you have lesser control, you don't actually control how they uh, authenticate, they would prob uh, they'd probably use SAML for most of, the, most of the part. They also use OpenID Connect with SAML. You can use CBA if you're coming from mobile apps. You can use CBA, SAML, and OpenID with SAML. Yeah. The choices are different. You know, this is just a reference slide for you to understand what are your options. You know, at the end of the day, your options are not limited, but your options might change across dif different device platforms. So keeping that in mind, what we discussed about Kerberos or what we discussed about SAML, you need to understand is Kerberos is very specific to device type. You know, Android has a smaller story when it comes to Kerberos, but iOS works great. What's great about SAML and about mobile and access is it works across platforms. It works on Android, it works on iOS, and it works for Windows. So you have that strategy for all the three in, in a single product, which is just uh, you know phenomenal for single sign-on. Because if I have to deploy single sign-on for three different device platforms, it doesn't make sense to deploy three different solutions and then maintain them, while you can do that in mobile and access in a single pane. Uh, so that's, that, that's all we have. I'm actually glad we could cover it in less than, uh, in less than 30 minutes. And let's take a question or two. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to just raise your hands and... I'll just put this on and you can... Sure, thank you. Hi. Thinking about the... Uh, the MI access with, uh, if you change your, um, I guess with that third party service, you change uh, the, the provider, the IDP provider to access. Um, what happens if you are wanting to um, still access that service from like a non-managed desktop browser or something like that? So uh, it's a great question. The question was, if you are trying to access uh, your apps or your services from an unmanaged application, you know, what do you do about it? It's really depending on your corporate uh, policy. Do you really want to give access to people outside the organization? Or do you trust them coming from specific browsers or specific IP resources? 
uh, you can do all that in access. You can define conditional policies yeah. saying, hey, you know what, if they come from this particular VPN head, allow them. You know, if your users are using, uh, let's say, an unmanaged device, which is not part of Mobile Iron, but they're using VPN, you can say if the user comes from Cisco VPNs, IP address, allow them. So you can define all these granular custom policies for devi different device platforms in Access today. All right, uh, I've been told that we have time for only one question, so thank you very much. I'll be here, so just you can feel free to ask questions. Yeah, I'll, sure I'll be here too. will be here too. Thank you, Atul. Thank you.